Alex. Thank you. So I'm very happy to welcome you all uh, to the third online seminar uh, for this year. And the fourth is from the project of the Department of International Relations in our university, the National Research University, Higher School of Economics, uh, also with the International Laboratory on World Order Studies and New Regionalism and the Bulgarian Club in our university. Uh, the European Integration and Eastern European Aspect that's supervised by Professor Alexander Lukin, where in few lectures, we will try to present the most pressing issues uh, of the European Union. My name is Stefan Stianov, and I'm going to be your host today, and I'm also the Vice Chairman of the Bulgarian Club. Uh, today, we're very excited because we have a very uh, special guest who managed to take uh, time of her very busy schedule as a member of the European Parliament, uh, Stimna Penkova. Uh, and we're very pleased that, uh, that she accepted our invitation and will tell us some uh, first-hand information uh, how the European Union actually works and uh, maybe some details um, of the latest policies of the European Union. Uh, she holds a master's degree in financial economics from Oxford University in the United Kingdom, and as well two bachelor's degree from Bocconi University in Italy and the Central European University in Hungary. And also she was a part uh, in an exchange program at uh, McGill University in Canada. She has gained professional experience as, an, as a financial specialist uh, in an investment fund in London an investment banker in the Royal Bank of Scotland and an analyst in Egon Zender. She's also a co-founder of Millennium Club Bulgaria, a think tank of young Bulgarians who have found their academic or professional realization abroad, but uh, currently working for the future of Bulgaria, building bridges between uh, Bulgarians all around the world. Uh, she's also co-chair of the uh, Young Talent Development Committee of the Royal Bank of Scotland and charity working with children with autism. Since 2019, she has been a member of the European Parliament, a member of the group of the Progressive Alliance of Socialists and Democrats in the European Parliament. And at Stelna Penkova is a participant in various European committees, including the uh, Committee on budget, Budgetary Control, the Committee on Industry, Research and Energy, the Committee on Regional Development, the Committee on the International Market and Consumer Protection, uh, as well as various delegations, uh, the delegation to the Parliamentary Committee on Stabilization and EU-Serbia Association, delegation for relations with Japan, delegations for relations with uh, countries of Southeast Asia and ASEAN. And uh, it's very nice when we, when, we, when we have someone with such a huge biography, but it's very hard to read everything. We, we had to cut some things because the host is going to be without bread. And now let's not waste more time. I'm very happy to give the floor to our lecturer, Tilna Penkova. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Stefan. Um, and thank you all for being here and uh, taking uh, some time for your uh, Friday afternoon and Friday evening, actually. It's a pleasure to be here and it's a pleasure always for me to be speaking uh, with young people who are interested uh, in politics and in everything that's happening nowadays in the world. Uh, it's, it's genuinely a pleasure and I hope it's uh, not the last time we speak to each other, we see each other and this is an opportunity for us to create a relationship and to be able to, to address some of your uh, concerns, questions and uh, probably further topic of interest for you. Uh, thank you for, uh, for the extensive uh, introduction. I think the most important thing uh, that uh, I want you to know is like, I'm uh, one of the youngest members of the European Parliament. Uh, I'm coming from Bulgaria. Before stepping into that role, uh, I used to be in the financial sector, uh, working mostly in the, in the UK. So uh, at the end, I'm sure I'm not gonna touch upon that topic, but uh, if you have any questions regarding Brexit, I'm happy to address them because I'm taking the matter very personally, since um, unfortunately uh, I was in the, in the heart uh, of the city of London when it was all happening. So I've seen it all life, but this is probably also an interesting topic for another conversation we're having. This is an unprecedented thing that was happening in Europe uh, when we saw a member state uh, leaving the European Union. 
But I'm sure that today's lecture is just going to set up the grounds in terms of like how the EU works, because it's a very complicated uh, process we've put in place in the European Union. And to be honest, it's very difficult even for some of the member states and for our um, EU citizens to understand. So that's why I will start the lecture with giving just a brief overview before we go into the more specific, interesting policies uh, we are dealing with simply because it's, uh, it's important to know the structure and how the decision-making process goes uh, before we go into the uh, specifics, which I'm sure you're going to relate quite well because the matters we're dealing with at EU level are more or less the, the global matters at the moment. They've been triggered, uh, of course, by the unprecedented COVID crisis we've all uh, foreseen at the moment, and some uh, quite more interesting matters related to the green transition uh, to the digitalization that's uh, all going through and usually uh, from conversations like that I found that the young people are the most proactive uh, participants and triggers of, of those policies so uh, it would be a pleasure to, to touch upon them. Uh, just as a remark like usually conversations and uh, meetings uh, like that unfortunately this time it's only online but hope we're gonna have the chance to make it in person in the near future the, the meetings with younger people are always the most uh, challenging for me because of the curiosity and the straightforwardness of the questions and uh, and topics you usually raise so don't be afraid to ask anything and uh, I'll, I'll try my best to 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 answer another Remark before we start, I was just speaking um, with uh, Stefan before we started. There is a bit of a storm weather conditions uh, on the continental part of Europe. I'm in, I'm in France at the moment. So if there are any problems with the connection, because it has been a bit, uh, a bit of disturbances through the whole day, please let me know and I will try my best to resolve it as quickly as possible. I'm just giving that as a heads up because uh, in the technical um, the technical aspects, sometimes they're unpredicted things we, we cannot uh, have control of. Uh, having said that, I think uh, we can proceed to the lecture. I have prepared a brief presentation which would help us lead through some of the topics we're going to be covering today. Uh, and I'll be giving an indication when to change slides. So uh, the topic we've chosen to cover uh, with you uh, today is like effective EU and global policies uh, for achieving sustainability or more specifically, what's gonna happen in the future in the policy, in the business and education, in the education world on the path towards economic, green and energy transition. So if we can proceed to the first slide where I'm just gonna give a very, very brief overview in terms of um, how the European institutions are structured what are the main institutions, how they interact with each other. And trust me, like if you ask that question to many of, uh, of uh, the, the EU citizens, probably they would also get lost. So I'm just gonna touch upon like the most important, uh, the most important few so you know how, how it, actually, it actually works. So the first and the most important step is of course the um, executive institutions here we have the european council uh, which uh, consists of the leaders of the 27 already member states of the european union so it's um those are the meetings uh, among the prime ministers usually when they decide the objectives and set up the most important decisions and the legislations we need to put forward at the european level the second important executive player is the european commission it's again composed of 27 commissioners from each one of the member states. They are usually divided into, um, into specific uh, topics. For instance, the commissioner from Bulgaria, uh, Ms. Maria Gabriel, she is dealing with um, education and youth. So, um, and like the technological development of the European Union. So quite a lot of the legislative files that are coming through in those topics and that are concerning the younger generations of the European Union, they're going uh, through uh, our commissioner from Bulgaria, which we are uh, very proud of. The legislative, um, the legislative power, that's where we come in. Uh, that's where the European Parliament stands. 
until uh, two years ago, we used to be uh, 751 members. At the moment, we're 705 members from the European Parliament. This is uh, due, to the, um, due to Brexit, as I've started with. Each one of us is elected for a term of five years. And uh, each member state has representatives in the European Parliament. It's divided um, based on the population and the proportion. The biggest amount of members are coming from Germany. The second one in, is France. From Bulgaria specifically, it's uh, 17 members of the European Parliament. So I'm one of the 17 members of the European Parliament. And of course, in each of the um, elections in the country, uh, we are elected from different parties. I'm representative of the Bulgarian Socialist Party or the Party of Socialists and Democrats in the European Parliament. Um, in terms of uh, judicial institutions, we have the Court of Justice of the European Union and the European Court of Auditors. You can see that the one is more related to the citizens' uh, claims and um, um, and uh, problems which are going to the Court of Justice and the, the European uh, Court of Auditors, their main function is to be auditing the budget of the European Union. And the financial aspect, which um, I've selected to, to discuss a bit uh, in a bit more details further on in the lecture, because I think uh, the audience might have a bit more interest into the economic and financial matters as well. The financial institution, the main financial institution of the, um, of the European Union is the European Central Bank, like where the most policies, like the most monetary policies concerning the uh, euro as a currency, as a common currency for the European Union, that's where everything is decided. The European Central Bank was playing quite a significant role currently in the crisis in terms of easing some of the policies in the Eurozone making more capital available for the financial institutions and respectively uh, to the businesses and to the citizens in the various member states, just in order uh, to help out the um, financial and economic consequences of the COVID crisis. Uh, if we can uh, move to the next slide. And just, uh, yeah, this, is, uh, this is the building of the, of the, European, uh, of the European Parliament. Uh, where we have the, um, the option for visitors from each one of the member states to come and visit. We have the so-called visitors group where we give access to the institutions um, for, uh, for our citizens so they can, they can see how the legislation um, is, being, is being made. So um, in terms of, uh, let, let's, let's go to the, to the following slide. And I just before before we continue, maybe if you have any questions on the specific aspects I'm uh, touching upon, it would be easier to address them at the end. So just uh, put them down, and I guess it, in terms of logistics, it's going to be easier that way. I'll try to not uh, to not bore you with uh, too many random information facts, but uh, but I just wanted to set the grounds. We cover the European institutions more or less, and um, it's important to know the main European legal acts that are coming from the European institutions. So the first one is the European treaties. So basically this is the rule book for the European Union. So they lay down the objectives of the European Union, what we're meant to do, it lays down the criteria for the various member states when they are joining the European Union. It also lays down the criteria for the member states to be joining the Eurozone. The interesting aspect of the European treaties, and the more, most probably the most challenging one, is that um, they've been created this year. We have like 30 years anniversary of a few of them. Uh, so they are quite outdated. So they need to be updated, some of them. And we're going to be in the process of doing that in the next uh, coming years. The way the European Union had decided to do that is basing it on the, um, on the so-called conference on the future of Europe. This was an EU-wide initiative. 
in each one of the member states that was aiming to reach out to the citizens and ask them, how do they see the European Union develop? What do they want to see changing? What policies and what regulatory areas are important for them to be taken care of on a common EU level? So the, the promise was that everything that's coming through the Conference on the Future of Europe, which um, in its sense, it's an online platform where everyone can input their ideas or suggestions. And after that, an analysis would be conducted to see what are the common ideas coming from the various parts of Europe. Based on that feedback and on the suggestions, uh, all the European institutions, the Commission, the Council and the European Parliament would sit down together and would have to decide how this should be uh, implemented in terms of policies and if it requires some changes to the European Union treaties. So this is an ongoing process uh, that hasn't been opened enough in the past few years, but uh, with the extension of the European Union, um, sorry, with the expansion in terms of new member states and with Brexit, and now um, we do require some updates on that matter. The two most important legal acts, which I decided to touch upon, of course, there are a few others, which um, I, I don't think it, um, they're matters of importance for the, today's um, conversation. The regulations um, are the so-called legal acts that are decided by the European Commission, the European Parliament, and they're given to the member states to directly apply in their legislations. So if we have a regulation or a certain aspect of, for instance, um, climate change or uh, the transport sector, we just give the text to each one of the member states and they apply it directly into their legislation. So this is kind of the, the strongest legal act in terms of implication that the EU uh, can issue. The second most important one are the so-called directives. So um, they usually set the guidelines and the framework for achieving a certain result. So certain objectives. Um, in that matter, the directive is given to each one of the member states and they have up to two years to decide how to transpose it or make it part of their legislation. So it's not directly copy pasting the text from the legal act as in the regulation, but just uh, taking the objectives that are listed in the directive and making it part of the national legislations. So it has a bit of a weaker, um, weaker effect given it's different in different member states. And it's much easier and faster to issue it as it is, but it's also like quite valuable and uh, quite strong of a, of a legal act that we, that we issue from the European institutions. Uh, can we just move to the next slide? I just wanna make sure, yes, uh, if that's, uh, that's what I wanted to, to, set the, to set the ground for before we go into the more interesting, I hope, part of the lecture, but I thought it's important to understand the steps the interactions between the various institutions and what do they actually produce for the member states. So um, a lot of the policies and decisions we're gonna be taking at the EU level at the moment are of course dependent on the political context. And in the past two years, I guess it's not gonna be a surprise. Uh, the, the determining factor for everything uh, had been the, the COVID crisis. So uh, the unprecedented like economic, social and health crisis that was caused by COVID-19 changed completely the agenda of every government in the world in terms of how to tackle those problems, how to support the healthcare system, how to support the citizens, how to support especially the young people uh, and how to support the economy and the business in general. Because I, I don't think we've seen such a, a widespread and fastly um, developing um, kind of crisis that hit 
the whole world more or less at the same time. Even if you look back at the financial crisis, you know it lasted for many years. Uh, when it started in uh, 2007 in the US, more or less, it was affecting Europe in 2010, 11 already. So the span was much more widely spread in terms of the time frame. where with COVID, it was a matter of a few months for, um, for everything to be quite close to collapse, speaking in uh, financial and economic terms. So this did set up a very different playing field for everyone, uh, including the politicians on that matter. Of course, um, all the other parts I've listed on these slides, in the, on these slides, sorry, in terms of like the energy crisis, the, inf the global inflation, the inequality, injustice, they are more or less connect related, at least in the past two years, to what had been uh, caused uh, by COVID-19. One thing uh, was a common conclusion for everyone, I believe, like in every different part of the world. Uh, we need a more innovative and progressive approach in order to resolve that situation. And uh, the most important aspect, of course, this is a subjective opinion, but from my side and from what I've seen speaking with some colleagues, on what should we emphasize on and how we should be um, investing in resolving those issues were new technologies, investing in growth and uh, creating high quality jobs, especially when it concerns uh, young people, when it concerns small and medium enterprises and startups, because at least for Europe, it became evident um, that the um, young people and the small businesses are the backbone of the European economy. We had it overlooked in all fairness in the past decade, probably when we were all experienced like more or less massive economic growth. Um, but it became evident that without supporting them, it's gonna be very difficult to achieve um, anything in the future. We can move to the next slide now. So the main focus of our lecture today, uh, I've divided it into uh, four aspects. The first one um, is the Eurozone, which uh, we consider it in economic terms as an indication of unity, the EU. The second one is the answer to the COVID pandemic or the um, unprecedented common EU debt to um, guarantee recovery and growth. And the third topic is the Green Deal Europe and Europe's path towards sustainability. And the last topic, which uh, has been quite um, popular in the last four months, is the energy crisis and the way forward. I know that um, uh, the, the hosts and uh, your club is organizing something on the Green Deal in the near future, I think in March. So that's why, even though it's one of my favorite topics, I've decided not to spend too much time because I know you're going to have a dedicated lecture. So it's going to be a very brief few points uh, that I'm going to mention here. Uh, but uh, I couldn't, I just couldn't have skipped it. It like it was very difficult for me to to go around this topic because it's quite important. Uh, let's uh, let's move to the next slide. Okay, let me just try to figure out how, okay, perfect, sorry. I just wanted to, to modify a bit my screen so I can see everything on the slides as well. So uh, the use zone is a very important um, aspect in terms of how the whole European Union was set and established. In simple terms, um, something which I actually strongly believe in is that if it wasn't the Eurozone, zone, probably the European Union wouldn't have been that stable. Because the fact that we have a common currency among member states, not all, Bulgaria still, for instance, hasn't joined the Eurozone, uh, but the fact that we have a common currency, it, uh, it creates uh, very strong interdependencies between the member states, and it almost makes it impossible to be able to willingly break or leave the union because your economy and your 
monetary policy is so dependent from the other member states that it would be an absolute disaster if you decide to do so. Here's a remark. Uh, the UK was never part of the Eurozone, so it was much easier for them to leave. <laughs> um, so the, the single currency, except of dependencies, uh, it kind of enforces some of the stronger economies in the EU to be to be more willing to take care of some of the weaker, uh, economically speaking, weaker members of the union. And I'm just going to give you a practical example in terms of, if you look back in terms of what happened uh, during the financial crisis in Europe, I don't know if you recall or if you've been following, I'm sure, I'm sure you, you do know that um, when Greece had quite a very like deep financial crisis and quite significant problems with the amount of debt they had accumulated at that point. The European Union and especially Germany did step in to help out. And um, of course, we want to say it's, uh, it's solidarity. It's because um, we're all part of the same union and that's part of the part of the picture. The economic reasoning behind that is like the financial collapse of Greece would have split over effect on all of the member states and it would have hurt the German economy quite badly. So therefore, Germany, who had the efforts and the financial means to support Greece in that crisis, they basically had no choice. Because um, if the EU zone has troubles or um, if it starts collapsing, it's going to have immediate effect on the German economy and it's going to hurt uh, their export prices and their currency evaluation as well, which is not something anyone would allow. So in that sense, it was just an example to give you more like the economic and the financial reasoning behind the importance of the Eurozone. Of course, uh, the single currency in its sense for a union like ours is quite significant. When we're speaking, for instance, about uh, eliminating the cost of the currency exchange and transaction fees um, between the member states, it limits the possibility of speculations and, and rising prices. Because when we're speaking about the EU, we're speaking about an open market for free movement of goods and services and people. So if you have imports of certain goods from one member state to another, the common currency kind of limits the, the effect in terms of the prices. So if something costs five euros, for instance, in Bulgaria, it would cost the same amount in Greece and in Germany. Um, and of course, lastly, but not least, in terms of the biggest benefit, uh, I think of the Eurozone in the, in the European and the Euro as a currency, like it increases the investment activity in terms of the member states because it gives more security uh, given that the currency is stable all across so international investments or among the, the member states are, are more achievable and easier to easier to do and as i've already said the interdependency and the integration to the eu economy i think we can move to the next slide uh, so here, I just uh, wanted to touch upon a few speculations and fears about adopting the euro. And I'm just allowing myself to do that because I'm, I'm coming from Bulgaria. We're just one of the member states who is about to be joining the eurozone. At the moment, we have predicted this to be happening in 2024, if the economic conditions allow. And uh, let's hope that's going to be the case. But um, there are certain fears uh, when we're speaking about the common currency and adopting the euro. One of them is the fear of uh, loss of monetary sovereignty. So it means that you're giving all the monetary policies from the central bank to the European central bank. Uh, but this is, uh, this is a cost a lot of member states are willing to pay. Another the common concern is the rising prices and the inflation after the adoption of the euro, which is, of course, if we look, because I know you're all, uh, you're all students and uh, you're still quite uh, well related to the, 
to the fact that they, every fact we have should be based on data and proper analysis. And um, I'm uh, very much against those types of provocation and speculations because if you look properly at the data, uh, it says that none of the member states that was uh, joining the, the Eurozone had an inflation of more than 0 0.2, 0 0.3%. So uh, this is an, um, a fear and a concern that's based on no, uh, no statistical data. So um, I think those are some of the, some of the main concerns. Um, I'm just sharing them because if you have any questions or any interest after that on the topic, since we are more or less um, as, a, as, a Bulgarian, uh, as a Bulgarian representative, I'm following that quite closely just because we are at the, at the moment of probably joining the Eurozone. But in terms of everything I've said, I think uh, you could have figured and gasped all the benefits that are there for individuals, for businesses and for the economies of the European Union uh, in terms of, uh, yes, there is a cost, but um, I mean, the, the cost benefit analysis shows that it's better if we have the common currency that makes us a bit more uh, Codependent to each other. Uh, next slide, please. So, I mean, this is what what has already been said in terms of the unity is the key. So, the single currency provides stability, opportunity, and mechanism to achieve specific goals, as we've set up in the policy framework that I that I had uh, had given before. And now, moving to the next topic which uh, I think uh, it's going to be it's going to be a bit more uh, interesting for you in terms of the the crisis and I'm sure you're going to have uh, have some questions uh, sorry uh, sorry I just lost the screen for a second I hope yeah perfect um, so what was the answer to the pandemic so when it all happened um, it started hitting um, the European, the EU countries more or less beginning of 2020. So February, March was the, the moment when it started spreading. And we, we've all realized it's going to be a, a bit of a problem, actually, uh, when all the countries started acting a bit chaotically and something we haven't seen for for decades happen in terms of uh, border closing of borders, uh, forbidding of certain supply i mean the supply chain was completely disrupted like there were no medical equipment uh, like the transport sector in terms of like the the trucks going through europe to deliver goods in different parts of the continent everything was completely disturbed so it was quite it was about a month a month and a half of absolutely chaotic behavior across the across the eu and uh, for uh, for for a union that's uh, that's been running without borders or any restrictions uh, for the last decades, this was a bit of an unprecedented condition. So what we've decided to do at that point, um, there were talks about it in the, for the last 10 years and no one ever thought we we're going to be able to do that. Um, the European Union and in particular the European Commission decided to issue uh, common EU debt. So basically, which what, what does this mean is that the European Commission goes to the capital markets and they issue debt uh, using their very much better rating capacity compared to some of the member states. Once they issue that, they give the, the money and the help to each one of the member states at much better rates, as you can imagine, because they've already accessed it from the capital market using the European Commission rating which probably is good enough as the German one, but it's not gonna be, uh, it's much better than uh, some of the member states like Italy, Spain, Bulgaria, Romania. Like, you know how the, how, how the ratings and how the financial and economic markets work. So we did issue uh, a common EU debt. Another remark here that probably wouldn't have been possible uh, with the United Kingdom still in the union because they were always against those kind of two codependent um, economic, especially in financial terms, um, relationship within the EU. That's why they were not even part of the Eurozone. As you know, they wanted to keep their independence in that matter. 
So uh, without the UK on the table of the decision making, we did manage to do that. What does this mean? We call this common debt the so-called next generation EU. So it's a, it's a fund, I mean, it's funding of about 800 billion euros uh, that would be distributed to each one of the member states to help their economic and social and health and whatever other aspects it hit uh, from the from the COVID uh, from the COVID crisis um, consequences. So uh, the instrument we call it, like the next generation EU. I'm not gonna go into the details. I listed some of the main names of the funds. Trust me, we always get confused in terms of like. React EU, Recovery and Resilience Facilities. We have uh, all those crazy names here. But the most important thing you need to know about the, that instrument that we've issued is the fact that this is unprecedented common EU debt. It's about 800 billion euros that are, that's gonna be given and it's already been distributed to some of the member states to support them. And it's been uh, given in the form of loans and grants. So loans that are supporting businesses and small medium enterprises and grants which is like money you just put back in the economy and you don't expect a repayment so the, the member states have to be covering for that uh the those are the three most important features of the of the common debt and probably the most important one for me um is the conditions under which that's uh, that's going to be distributed to the member states um it should be money against reforms so the member states should be presenting specific projects and reforms they want to be doing with that money and uh if they don't achieve that uh they can be asked to return the money so it is actually a proper instrument for uh for 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 growth and not simply just uh, not just simply losing some certain amount of financial support. And uh, the second condition is uh, the member states have access to that amount of money only if they comply with the with the rule of law. So if they manage to do it to do the um, to, to have access to the to the financial support and distribute it in a transparent and fair way. You can, you can understand this is uh, mostly because of the, there were many, many scandals on corruption related to EU funding in certain member states. So we set that as a condition. So if there are any fears that the EU money, which is basically more or less coming from the European citizens taxpayers is misused, uh, the member states would not have access to that. We can go to the next slide now. So we've issued the common debt, but then we faced another challenge. Because when I was starting my mandate in 2019, the European Union had two important points on the agenda. One was the green transition, and the other one was the digital transition. So we had set up the whole agenda, the whole budget, everything that was coming in terms of policies and financing and everything was to be related to one of those topics. Then in 2020, COVID happens. So we were facing like the, min the biggest challenge ahead of us was how to support financially the digital and the green transitions in the EU in the context of uh, COVID-19 crisis. So, I mean, we had, the, we had the money, we had the question and we needed to, to figure out how to combine them. So what happened is, um, as I said in the previous slide, uh, the, the biggest bunk of this next generation funding is going into the so-called recovery and resilience plans that each one of the member states submits to the European institutions and based on those plans and based on those plans which are outlining reforms and projects that they want to invest they receive their money from the EU 
So each member state had to submit such a plan to be able to have access to the funds. The condition that was put for the plans was that, you can see that on the slide down there, a member state must allocate a minimum of 37% of the funding they receive from that recovery facility to climate investments and reforms. So basically to, uh, to, to support the green transition in terms of any projects related to energy efficiency, to, uh, to economic transition in terms of like how you change the production capacity, how you stimulate recycling, how you stimulate the circular economy because of the scarcity of resources we have. So almost one half of the money they receive should be going into such projects. So it is at the same time recovery and support for the businesses and transition. And about 20% of the money uh, should have been going into uh, digital and tech projects. So you can see that uh, without having much of an extra financing, we've tried to combine the two priorities we had which is the green transition and the digital transition with the, uh, with the recovery uh, from the COVID-19 crisis. I mean, I'm sure you might have some questions related to that, which uh, we can address later, uh, but that was the that was decision of the UN. It is still ongoing because the money from those uh, resilience and recovery plans, the money to the member states are just being uh, released at the moment. So the member states are starting to get them uh, and uh, to hopefully invest in their economies in those two um, in those two main directions, and of course many others, because uh, you, you can do the maths. It's still less than sixty percent as a condition. So uh, of course we acknowledge that there are other investments needed and other support to, to be able to recover from the from the COVID crisis. I can see that I'm spending very much uh, time on some of those things, so I'll try to speed up a bit because we still have two more topics to go. Uh, can we just move to the next slide? Perfect. This is, um, this is just like a, a small conclusion to this section. Uh, which, which is more or less what I've said, the ambitious political agenda was combined with the financial resources we had and um, hopefully with a common approach and uh, some collective responsibility, we're gonna be able to achieve the goals of the, of the transformation of our economy and the recovery from, uh, from COVID. And now, as I said, I'm moving to my next favorite topic, but I'm not gonna be spending too much time. I'm gonna be interested to to see what you're going to be uh, hearing about that in your dedicated lecture for that. So I've decided just to focus on how it all happened in Europe, in terms of how we've decided to have the Green Deal, what does it mean, and what were the main objectives. So I will give you like literally 20 seconds to, to look at the, um, at the timeline. As I said, it started in 2019. And unfortunately, it had to be postponed a bit uh, in the last two years. But we were still doing some things in the meantime. <clears throat> so what happened in 2019, and that was more or less adopted and agreed in the next uh, one year, exactly. Um, the European Commission presented the strategy to commit the EU to so-called climate neutrality by 2015, which means that the economic activities that are happening on the continent should be neutral to climate. Uh, it doesn't mean that we're not gonna have any emissions in terms of like our production capacities or like whatever economic uh, activities we do on the continent. It simply means that we're gonna take measures which are going to be having an opposite effect towards our emissions. So if we emit that much, we're going to take the measures to, to uh, invest in, uh, for instance, forestation or like things which are absorbing some of those emissions or filters for some of the production facilities or switching energy sources 
uh, what's happening at the moment, for instance, is like there is a massive move in Europe. I'm going to be speaking more a bit on that in the last part of today's lecture is uh, to shut down and to phase out the coal mining power plants because they emit quite a lot CO2 in the atmosphere and switch to more green and uh, ecologically friendly energy sources. So that's, that's been the goal in the next 30 years to achieve this uh, climate neutrality. Of course, to achieve that, we have certain small bits and uh, mid targets which you could see on the climate, um, sorry, which you could see on the timeline. But the most, uh, so this was the first important thing related to the Green Deal. For me, the second most important thing um, is what happened in, um, in April 2021. You could see that in the middle of the, of the graph over there. So the so-called European climate law, which did enter into force also in 2021. This was the, that's why I've started with the, what is the legislative act and what's the, what's the meaning of them. This is a binding uh, decision of the European Union, binding for all the member states. Uh, so basically all the targets and all the wishful thinking we had in terms of climate neutrality and uh, lowering emissions by more than 50%, etc., etc. et cetera, this had become part of the climate law which means all the member states have to follow that because it is a law. At that point, um, we had a lot of trouble in the EU because many of our counterparties from, uh, from all across the world, uh, they said that uh, we're gonna have, we're gonna lose our competitiveness. Like the, the, the com economic competitiveness of everything that's produced in Europe is going to become much more expensive. So we're just not going to just not going to have a playing field to be competitive on the global market. The goods, services, everything. This lasted for a few months and then quite a lot of the other big players uh, started joining us and started uh, putting in place targets for the green transition, climate laws, and I'm speaking literally about everyone, like um, US, India, China, Russia, like everyone started speaking about that and like putting that into place, setting targets, which some of them were a bit different from the European ones in terms of the time frame, but uh, it was a whole global move because it started becoming clear that probably if we don't change our way of, of life, our way of uh, like production and uh, manufacturing and everything, uh, we're going to have a bit, of a, a bit of a problem in the upcoming decades. So it became more or less a global initiative. As I said, you're going to be speaking more on that. I just wanted to give you the, 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 the gist of how it started in the EU. And uh, the fact that we're more or less proud about the fact that we started the push and it's now spreading, uh, spreading everywhere. And I'm sure as young people, you have a lot to say on those topics. Uh, and uh, probably you do understand the cause and the objective of those policies much more than um, some, of the, some of the older generations. That's everything I'm going to speak on the Green Deal. I'm working on a lot of files that are related closely to that. But as I said, let's move to the next topic. <clears throat> the energy crisis. So not only that COVID was more or less looking to be going back to, I mean, our lives seem, seem to be going more or less back to normal at the end of last year. Like there were, there were vaccinations available almost in every part of the world. Not everywhere, but like the process had started. So there was the light at the end of the tunnel in terms of the economic activity was starting to go back to normal. Travel was, was also starting to go back to normal, even though now we're having this uh, conference online. We still hope that in the next few months, we're going to be able to meet in person. That was not the case in 2020. So in 2021, we were starting to recover. And then uh, energy prices hit rock, uh, 
I mean, they rocketed at some point in terms of the the amounts and, and, and everything. This was a, a trend observed all over Europe. It is very, it's very difficult to still go back and find the proper reasons in terms of what happened in October and November, that now the energy prices are almost tripled at everywhere across the EU. There are many factors, probably from, um, from what I've seen, and like if you look um, at the proper economic financial terms analysis, if you, if you look at it, of course, the most obvious ones are like the, the raising prices of the CO2 emissions that we have in the, in the EU, because we tax that and the taxes got higher. The, the price of the gas also went up. For me, probably one of the most significant uh, aspects that led to that increase was also the, the global supply chain crisis. Because due to COVID, what happened was the production capacity slowed so much. I mean, they, they slowed down, like some of them even stopped for a bit. And all of a sudden, when we started going through the process of recovery in 2021, at least in the first half, like everything started working and they've tried to go back to the pace that was the pre-crisis level, but there were no resources, not enough energy, like um, not enough, um, if you want to say like, there's some countries which didn't even have ordered enough supply of coal or gas, like when they're dependent on, um, on imports for those, uh, for those resources. So what happened was uh, the demand for some of those resources doubled in a matter of a few months. And if you know how the supply and the demand uh, chart works, of course, when you have an extensive demand for something and the supply is still limited, prices go up. Like that's simply how the chart moves. So that's what happened. In terms of uh, in terms of many of the the spillover effect that was not only in the energy prices but also in the services and goods like the inflation that we've mentioned before, it was more or less because of the disruption in the global supply chain that people just tried to move back to so quickly and it was impossible when you have the the almost stopped economic activities for a few months to expect to be able to go back to, to the pre-crisis levels. Uh, but that's basically the what happened before and how we see the, the effect in the energy prices. If we move to the next slide, uh, I did mention some of those uh, aspects already, but it's important to know um, at least from from the perspective of the union, I'm speaking here, like what is the way forward and like how we can, uh, how we can avoid that happening in the future. As I said, the two main reasons uh, identified so far, please look at the second part of the slide. I'm gonna um, speak first about the second part and then go back to the first part. Like the two most important reasons for the energy prices were the increase in the CO2 emission taxes and the increase of the gas price, which I'm mentioning again, I think the increase of the gas price was more or less due to a very, very bad uh, coordination and not ordering enough supply sufficiently in advance. I'm speaking from the European Union. Um, and the, the, the question and the conclusion is what actions are needed to be, uh, to be able to avoid this happening in the future? Um, I, I've mentioned that several times, it is more or less related to the Green Deal. We need diversification of energy sources, probably more investment into um, green energy sources. It is not possible in every part of the continent, but in some of them it is. Here I'm speaking about solar panel, offshore wind, onshore wind. Uh, so there are some solutions that we still have to have to work on that and develop it. And this is not going to be the, of course, not going to be the only solution simply because when we're speaking about some of the, the green energy sources like the wind or the solar I've been just mentioning, uh, we, should be, uh, we should be aware that they're um, seasonal, like they depend on the seasonality to a certain extent. 
we still don't have very good um, storage capacities in terms of batteries to be able to store the energy that's produced by them if we don't use it immediately. So there's some shortcomings to those sources, but it doesn't mean that we shouldn't start using them actively in, um, in, our, um, in our energy mix. Go to the next slide because I mean this is going to be going towards the end of that um, that section as well, and this is some of the interesting conclusions and some of the realizations and uh, actual policies that are happening now in the EU because of that. As I said, green energy sources are great. We're investing quite a lot in that, and we're going to keep on doing that. But we need also base energy sources, which are not seasonal and which can produce constant output of energy to satisfy the needs of the economy, the manufacturing processes, citizens, etc. So um, what has been happening in the discussions on that matter is um, there is debate in the European institutions going on now and it's going to be active in the next probably five, six months more or less. If we can define nuclear energy and natural gas, if they can be defined as sustainable and green energy sources, where the, the caveat is that natural gas is going to be considered as sustainable and green only as a transition fuel for the next 10, 15 years. Uh, and nuclear could, uh, could be considered for much longer. You understand that uh, this is more or less triggered by the energy crisis and the energy prices, and this guarantees a stable energy system, especially when you have, for instance, nuclear in the mix. And in conjunction with some of the green sources we've already mentioned, then it's going to guarantee certain stability uh, for, the, for the energy uh, everywhere in Europe, I think, not specifically speaking about the EU here. Uh, so, the, so the debate is quite long. I mean, if you have questions, I can uh, give you some, uh, some hints. I'm participating in that, especially on the nuclear side, because as a country, as one of the member states who has almost 40% of the energy mix, depending on nuclear power plant, uh, we are quite keen to have that energy granted as a proper source in the future. Uh, but of course, there are some colleagues who uh, are addressing some of the safety concerns and everything. I genuinely think that um, with the proper arguments, which are based on the scientific approach and like the scientific data, we should be able to twin that, twin that argument. But I'm going to be happy to see your comments and questions on that as well. And almost final slide, I promise it's the one before the last. So I've said that more or less already. When we speak about the energy transition and how to resolve the energy crisis and what's the way forward, we should be taking decisions that are based on science, technological developments without ignoring that and global cooperation because here none of us is, um, is alone. Our uh, the world is so globally interconnected at the moment that when we're speaking about decisions and solutions in the long term for those matters, we should all be working together. And last slide, I saw the impatience there in the clicking. <laughs> so a few final remarks. Um, I, I've repeated that many times. So just have a look uh, at the slide. And um, I'm saying this is more or less like the on the global scale, scale of things, how we should be working all together. COVID more or less had, had showed it to us that without coordination and cooperation, we could not be able to, to conquer and to, con I mean, to, to fight most of the challenges that we're facing. In every part of the world, we did face the same problems and it was a good uh, wake up call that no matter where we live, most of the problems we have are gonna be the same. And if we share experience, knowledge, expertise, and even workforce, we should be more able to, to resolve those problems in a faster and more efficient manner. So I've started that in the first few slides. I think it was, I was mentioning that 
last last sentence when I was speaking about the Eurozone, but I'm going to repeat it here. Unity is the key. And as I said here, I'm not speaking only about the EU, but about all the, all the global partners and all the big kind of significant players uh, in the world. Like, I think we should be leading the, the road to that unity. Otherwise, otherwise, we're each going to be facing the same problems and trying to resolve them alone, which is uh, not the best way, probably. Thank you. I'm sorry I spoke much longer than I was meant to. I hope you did manage to get some of the some of the important aspects. And I I I realized that I've probably covered too many topics than I should have had. And now, uh, but I was as I said, I was very excited to meet you, and I was also worried to to be to be able to speak more before you start with the questions. So, <laughs> but now it's time for questions and uh, and comments and remarks. Thank you very much. Well, I think that time actually flows very very quick and very nice when when you're learning something and when you when you when you're hearing something interesting that concerns you so in this way uh, don't worry everything was was just perfect and uh, i really like like the uh, green part deal and i think this is the right time to announce that uh, we're going to have a meeting actually uh, dedicated to European uh, energy and uh, climate security strategy that is going to uh, held on 10th of March. It's going to be with Martin Vladimirov from the Center uh, for the Study of Democracy and I highly recommend it. And uh, now, as you said, yes, it's time for Q&A. We already have four questions. Uh, yes, you should, write, you should raise your hand and I'm going to give you the opportunity or you can write your questions uh, in the comment sections. Actually, the first uh, question was from the comment section uh, from Shahriyar Ismail Pujaya, uh, who is asking, uh, joining the EU zone implies the loss of control over monetary policy and the transfer of powers to the level of the European Central Bank. Does the uh, interdependence in the economic sphere create additional risks uh, for the fin financial stability of the state during crises? And next we're going to move to the others. But if you can start with this question. Sorry, yeah, I'm not mute. So the question, if I understand it correctly, is like the, the loss of monetary tools. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, what happens during uh, during crisis? Yes, you do lose monetary so sovereignty when you uh, when you join the the European the, the eurozone. Sorry, I mean probably not the probably not the loss is not the right word because you do move some of the responsibilities of the central bank to so the European Central Bank but you are still part of the decision-making process. So all the decision by the ECB are taken by the central bankers of the main, of the member states. So uh, you still have a central bank and central banker is sitting together with the Germans and with the Dutch and with the French people, and they all decide the, the, the common policies. So it is sharing, not losing the monetary sovereignty, and in terms of crisis and how you tackle them, I, I've given the example. It has a cost because you're not that free to use the monetary tools in terms of like um, interest rates, for instance, which is the most common and like monetary um, quantitative easing policies, which were applied, like, for instance, the way the Fed is applying it. It's not the same way in Europe. It will never be that easy. So there are certain restrictions, but in terms of uh, the example I gave with Greece and, and uh, Germany, for instance, if something like that happened, you also have the benefit of being able to, uh, to count on the other partners there as well. But ab absolutely right, in terms of switching the responsibilities, yes, you, you're less flexible in terms of monetary, monetary policy yourself. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So we have uh, four questions. The first one is going to be for Georgi Ivanov. You can unmute now. Uh -huh. Yes, um, thank you very much for the lecture. Um, it was very interesting for us. Um, my question is, how can you characterize the relations between the uh, European Union and the African countries? Um, we saw that um, the two-day uh, summit of the African Union and the European Union started yesterday. 
Um, in your opinion, are there prospects for more um, active uh, future cooperation and are there any um, European Union interests in Africa today? Um, is it possible to, to find some common points for partnership with Russia also? I mean, in specifically in this region. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Georgi. So yeah, it's true. You you've been following uh, quite uh, actively if you if you know the African uh, country summit and everything had started recently. So just to bring it back, that this was also on the table in terms of the the further developing the relationships with Africa from the side of the EU. This was still on the table in 2019. Unfortunately, uh, the agenda had been postponed. It seems that there is quite a strong desire for cooperation and uh, generally from what i've seen i think most of the investments in the relationship which are going to be there are going to be in terms of the um, it, it might sound weird but it, 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 it will be the case at least those are the hints we're getting now in terms of the technological development and like some of the technologies and uh, what we are developing in europe and what we are doing it you know that um Africa is a bit of an interesting economic um, situation, at least some of the countries that because of the relationships with the, with the more developed parts of the world, they did skip a few stages in terms of the technological development. So they had a Wi-Fi network without having wires in some of the countries. I'm sorry for the simplified example, but it is like that they, do, they did skip a few stages. So uh, I genuinely think the cooperation is going to be more or less on that side. And in terms of like also the energy transition and the, the green energy and those resources, so we have quite strong relationships with some countries in North Africa in terms of like solar energy, hydrogen, hydrogen energy, like those facilities are being developed there. And it's a matter of transmitting into Europe. So. I have the feeling that we're going to have like a codependency in terms of the energy transmission, especially with Northern Africa, at least that's what I know so far, which probably is going to develop further on. So to, to simply answer your question, yes, there is a ground it's going to further develop. Those are the two topics I could identify at the moment. I'm sure there are going to be many more. And you asked the relationship EU Russia in, uh, in general, if I'm not mistaken. Right? Yeah. I, you know, this is a topic that's always been on the table for us and we've been discussing it quite actively. I genuinely think on the energy side, the two countries, I'm sorry, you, it's not a country, the two parties are quite, uh, quite correlated as well. So um, I'm not going to go into details of that, but I, I genuinely think a lot of the subjective tensions at the moment would be overlooked by the economic and energy cooperation and the need of that cooperation between the two parties. So I'm a bit more positive in that aspect. So it's gonna I have the feeling it's gonna be getting better and better because that contradiction that was happening in certain periods of time back in the days has no value for none of the parties. And I think this, is, um, this has been evident now. So more positive on that side. Thank you very much. Uh, Mark Dutchenko. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you very much. Uh, I learned in Bulgarian, so благодарю много за ваше то представление. Uh, I'm studying on the, at the International Relations of Russian President's Academy in St. Petersburg on the third uh, year. Uh, so uh, thank you very much. It was a pleasure for me and for everyone uh, to listen to you. Uh, it's uh, also hard to choose even a couple of questions, but I have a short uh, question in words, but uh, expanding in the meaning. In your own opinion, why Bulgaria decided to adopt, uh, not to adopt a South, um, a, a South stream? Uh, is it uh, some... Uh, Okay, that's all, that's all. That's, uh, that was my first question. And the second question is, uh, I was uh, internship in uh, a general consulate of Republic of Bulgaria in St. Petersburg this summer. And uh, in, this, in this connection, I have uh, a question about a visa regime between Russia and Europe. 
in your opinion and your point of view is it possible uh, in the nearest future to uh, open a visa between russia and europe thank you very much for your questions uh, for your answers thank you so first question in terms of south stream and like why we decided i mean this was an absolutely political uh, discussion there of government which i have nothing to say about like um, i would like to not comment on some of their decisions like the previous one but uh, in in terms of like the the economic impact it's gonna have it's gonna be massive and huge uh, you you've heard I'm, I'm sure you've got the grasp but i'm more on the economic and financial side rather than the national relationships but uh, genuinely if you ask me because you ask about the personal opinion and i think this is an opinion shared by by many people economically this was uh, this was not a good decision because as you've seen the pipeline had found its ways and now it's surrounding bulgaria so we're just not going to be part of that and we're not going to have the benefit of additional additional energy source so i i genuinely don't think it was strategically both uh, both economically and geopolitically correct decision but um, we have to live with that at the moment uh for the visas uh that's an interesting question but here I have to make a remark. We don't have a common EU policy on that. So visas and everything is decided by each one of the member states uh, because it's a prerogative of each one of the member states separately. Uh, so the, speaking about common visa to Russia, I genuinely don't think the EU legislation allows it as it doesn't allow it to any other country. For instance, there are some member states, I'm just going to give an uh, example with whichever country you want to take, but like, let's, if, if we take the US, because uh, I know for Bulgaria or Canada, for sure, like many countries don't need visas to those countries, Bulgaria does need. So it's not like a matter of the EU common policy. We just don't have the prerogative in that. So it's a matter of each one of the member states to be doing it. Unfortunately, that's the, for, for a lot of those things, it's, uh, the union is just not overtaking the the national government's responsibilities thank you very much martin still has a question as well yeah so thank you for the fascinating lecture it was a real pleasure li listening to you and uh, as you mentioned uh, nuclear energy is one of the most critical areas in the energy policy so uh, why is nuclear energy so important for the e European Union? And what are the Union's future plans in the development of this source of energy? Why is it so important? Because we have no other choice at the moment. <laughs> I mean, genuinely, simply, we don't have an alternative. I don't know in terms of having looked at the data at proper EU, um, EU level. But um, I would just give you a few examples of a few countries like in, um, in Bulgaria, starting from Bulgaria, 40% of the energy is coming from coal power plants, 40 is coming from nuclear. As I've mentioned, we're going to be shutting down the coal power plants at some point in the next 15, 20 years. And then you have to compensate that energy from somewhere else. And nuclear is something which we know how it works, it's clean, it doesn't have additional emissions. The technology is very much developed at the moment and keeps on being developed in terms of addressing all the safety requirements. This is the example of, of, of Bulgaria. Germany, not Germany, Germany is about uh, the 50% is coming from renewables and the rest is coming from nuclear and coal and they're shutting both nuclear and coal at the moment so I'm not really sure what Germany is going to do but I think it's called Nord Stream 2 at the moment that's why gas is in that package as well uh, and France 70% uh, of the energy in France is coming from nuclear so those are just few examples. I've used the two biggest economies and uh, ours because I do know the more or less the energy mix. We just don't have any other alternatives at the moment. And this is a technology we know. It exists and it's much easier to further develop it in Europe. And also something which uh, a lot of people are overlooking at the moment. When we're speaking about green transition, we're switching, we're speaking about changing a lot of our activities to um, electricity supply needs and 
it's very complicated what I try to say. It's not that complicated. I mean, uh, we're going to be dependent on more electricity. We're going to need more e electricity. For instance, if you look even at the transport sector, this is the example I'm always giving. We're speaking about electric cars that are going to be for massive use in the next 10 years. If you switch all the cars we have now on combustion engines in Europe, and I'm speaking about public transport and I'm speaking about uh, every, like the light, uh, the light uh, duty vehicles. If it all goes into electricity, at that exact point, we're going to need double the amount of electricity we produce at the moment in Europe. You cannot simply do that only with the familiar renewables we have currently available with solar and wind. It's just not going to be possible. So we need nuclear, we'll need hydrogen in the future, but it's still not developed. So to balance this out, in simple terms, nuclear so far fits the boxes in terms of not having emissions and being considered as green and sustainable, and that's why it's so important. Thank you very much. Next question is from Robert Rousseff. You can. Hello. Um, first, I would, uh, I would also like to thank you about the lecture. It was it was an amazing thing, especially for me who just came out of work. And it was an interesting it, it was an interesting way to diversify the day. So I would actually like to to ask a question as a follow up to what Martin mentioned a bit earlier. And uh, that is, I would like to expand on the nuclear power question and ask about the, uh, ask and inquire about it from a socio-political point of view. Now, I think we can, we can, most of us here can agree that that, that maybe the main, the main uh, barrier that is standing between us and a more, a more extensive use of nuclear power is not so much sa safety, our safety concern is. As, it, as, a, as, as much as it is a, a question of public perception. Now I'm saying that as someone who is literally standing in a laboratory that's, um, that produces radiation uh, in the, for, a, for, a, for a big chunk of its operation. And, uh, and yeah, so if, 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 if it is such a big deal, if it's such a big problem, then how are countries like France, uh, how has France been able to, to heavily invest into that field for so long now? And all the other countries just shun it entirely. Thank you. I think it's more or less uh, uh, comment to your question, if I'm not mistaken, in terms of you just asking, how is it possible that there are so many countries who absolutely understand the, that there are not that many safety concerns and uh, you're just asking about how we can change or what's the public perceptions in the others i'm sorry for making you repeat probably oh, sorry um yeah i'm just i'm just i'm just i'm just wondering how how come uh, uh how come france is many uh the the french government is managing to sell the idea to its citizens and and while the other while the other European countries just uh, just plainly dismiss investing into nuclear, it's so genuinely the division is not that. I mean, quite a lot of countries in Europe are supporting nuclear. Actually, it's not that many who are against. Like the strong uh, the the strongest opinion again uh, against nuclear are coming from Austria, Spain. Italy so so at the moment so they don't have much experience on that uh, most of the other ones almost each one of the countries has a nuclear power plant in their in their territory so they're more or less fine with that um, but um, in terms of the perception it's very easy to to play with the fears of people just by mentioning a few accidents in the recent one in Japan as well um, it's an I cannot answer your question in terms of it is playing with the fears of the people. I don't think this is fair. This is not normal to be using one example of something that happened as uh, dismissing a whole technology or like just saying it is unsafe. But some people in public positions do allow those, themselves to be doing that. And it's simply a game of fears. Like they just intensify the fear 
Uh, and that's how the public perception changes. Genuinely in Europe overall, I don't think there is a massive perception, like no, no, not massive, but not even a close to, definitely the majority is supporting nuclear. Even in Germany, when they're switching off all the nuclear power plants, the public opinion is not that strong against. People do understand that if it's happening, it is should be, it should be fine. And especially like I'm gonna speak of Germany because they, I, I, my personal opinion is they've done a mistake by starting to shut down their nuclear power plants. They're closing the last three working ones this year. So, uh, but the public opinion there, it's not that easily manipulated because they, they have the clear understanding that if it's that much of a safety matter, France is bordering, with, I mean, they share a border. It's just there, if something happens, it's gonna affect them even though they don't have the power plant in their territory. So I think it's um, a mixture of some wrong political populist decisions at some point rather than scientifically based uh, based approach. And uh, I don't think the public opinion is that easily manipulated except if you don't start playing with their fears quite a lot, which, uh, which is happening in some countries, but not in too many, I think. Well, while we're talking about green energy and nuclear energy, um, and we should always, we should never forget that nuclear energy is green energy. I absolutely agree with you. Uh, we have a question, a new, a new question from Shakhdiya Rusman who, uh, who asks, uh, how can Russia and the European Union cooperate on the issue of green energy uh, transition and on the uh, climate agenda? Can cooperation benefit the both sides? First of all, the, the short answer is, of course, I think that cooperation is the, it should be, it will be benefiting both sides for sure. Um, and how they can cooperate, like, I mean, of course, the energy codependence between EU and Russia, as I've mentioned, is quite strong. Like, first of all, even on the nuclear side, you know that a lot of the, um, the power plants that are in Europe are coming from Russia. So I think the cooperation there and the need for that going forward has been quite clear and it's evident. Also with the, with the gas dependency, it is the same. Like it's a resource which is definitely mostly coming from Russia. We don't have that um, enough, uh, enough uh, resources in Europe for that. But I, I'm sure we could uh, try to do more in terms of the new uh, renewables, and I'm not speaking about the ones that already exist, but I'm speaking about technologies like hydrogen and anything which would be considered green and it's still in the development stages. Because for instance, for that one, we still have issues in terms of the safe transportation, the cost, the production cost, uh, the, the storage. So I think those are aspects where I would imagine that the Russian Federation have a lot of expertise and knowledge to offer and some common projects in that I don't see why there is an issue to be developed because as we've said in, uh, in uh, some other aspects it's a, it's a matter of cooperation to be able to reach some of those decisions and another example I'm going to give here about an existing cooperation between the EU and Russia quite strong one I was just visiting a project like a few weeks ago in south of France um, the project is called ITER and it's a nuclear fusion project, uh, which involves uh, it's a cooperation between uh, seven parties, EU, Russia, China, India, South Korea, Japan, and the US. So all of them are there developing a massive project. I mean, uh, if you check in my social media afterwards, you can see the, uh, you can see some of the pictures. So it is, what are they doing, all of those countries? Uh, they're trying to, to create a proper fusion reaction, big enough and uh, strong enough that it can produce energy. It's a pretty expensive and very long-term projects, but, um, project, but from what they've said, like the experts there when I was visiting, they said that the realistic expectation is this might be ready in the next 10 to 12 years and be available for commercial use. And this is nuclear fusion, not fission, which is the, the, the typical nuclear power plants we're talking about. 
it's quite clean and controlled reaction. They don't have nuclear waste. You don't have the safety concerns. So if this is successful, this is basically the future of uh, the global energy supply, I think, more or less. I'm not sure if I'm exaggerating from, from some of the questions I got the engineers, but at least that's how it was presented to us. And the project started in the early 2000s. So it's been actively uh, financed and uh, supported by scientists from all the seven parties involved already for 20 years. And the fact that they have a span for the next 10 to 12 years to make it work kind of gives me the, the hope that this is something which should probably be, uh, be successful. That much investment in terms of human resources and financial resources. So this well, is an example where we're working together actually. And we're working together in Europe. This is also an important part. <laughs> Uh, well, we had a question from Valentina, but um, uh, at the moment she, oh, okay, so she told me that the question was pretty much the same. Uh, well, then um, I'm going to have a question. Uh, mm -hmm. I actually very hesitated to ask it because um, to be honest, the topic is a little bit more sad, but I sincerely hope that um, I'm going to get a very positive answer. And uh, we see that some countries as Hungary and Poland are, um, to put it like that, they're provoca provocating the European Union, they're challenging the European Union. And even Orban suggested that his country could, could actually leave the Union. So, so my question is how seriously uh, this is taken in Brussels or this is just a populist rhetoric? And it, Maybe it's even connected with Brexit. Uh, if you if we go back uh, even uh, to that yeah. time, yeah. Mm -hmm. So they have elections in Hungary now. I genuinely don't think that there is a space. I mean, we spoke about uh, Robert when he was speaking about public perception. Here, it's very important, like the proper public perceptions and what politicians tell you. The public perception is. I had the chance to live in Hungary for two years. I've never felt those people like the, the population is Eurosceptics or anything like I'm speaking about a few years ago. Uh, but uh, genuinely, I think it's a political speculation. I don't think there is a ground or fear for anything like that. And the, the, probably the, the most, the strongest sign on that is gonna be the elections. I think they're coming up uh, late spring in Hungary. So we're gonna see how that's gonna happen. But uh the the problems there are coming in terms of the the more criteria and more restrictions coming from the eu in terms of some of the fundings we're providing that's a, the hungarian reaction is quite well related to something we've spoken about in the beginning of the lecture when i was mentioning the recovery and the resilience funds that are available to each one of the member states if they submit the plan. Hungary, uh, their plan is uh, not approved yet because there's some uh, problems regarding the uh, rule of law and how they distributed existing EU funding. So they just haven't received that support financing yet because of that. So it is quite normal for them to be using that decision that came out from the uh, European Court on Tuesday this week, um, if I'm not mistaken. And they're just using that to say that um, they're not going to be following the, the rules and like the EU is oppressing them simply because of a judgment decision which says that they need to follow the rules to be able to receive the funding. It's a bit of a political game there, which is, um, I, I don't appreciate it because it's, uh, as I said, it's speculating with facts and provoking opinions but i have the the hope and the trust in the hungarian uh, citizens that they wouldn't be misled and they, I, I don't think they're your skeptic majority there and the union is going to be stable i i think that uh, this is a very nice uh final synthesis for our meeting and um, it was actually a great pleasure to host you and to have this interesting meeting i especially want to thank to Espen Kova for accepting our invitation once again, because we know that uh, her schedule is very, very, very busy. And we really hope that there are going to be uh, more meetings like this one. And 
Thank you all uh, again for participating. Thank you all for your questions. And we hope to see you soon. Our next seminar on the 10th of March, we're going to talk more about the Green Deal and uh, energy security. Once again, thank you and uh, have a nice night. Thank you so much, guys. See you soon, hopefully. Thanks. <laughs>